Good morning, everybody. I am so glad you are here to join us in worship of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ together. No matter where you are, I am glad we can gather around the reality that our God is King and our God is Lord and our God is present. Despite everything you might see going on in the news this week, despite everything that would suck away our peace in life, Today we actually talk about God's peace. Today we're talking about what it is to be peacemakers in God's kingdom. And as we begin this morning, I want to open with our call to worship verse from Isaiah 26, verse 3, which says, You will keep the mind that is dependent upon you in perfect peace, for it is trusting in you. It is a statement of trust in our God, no matter what external circumstances are saying. So in light of that, in light of all the news stories we've seen this week, let's pray as we begin our time of worship this morning as we talk about and gather around that idea of peace. Let's pray. Our Lord and our Savior, we do come to you today, some of us in a major state of upheaval, some of us uh, very uh, turbulent in our thoughts, in our emotions, as we look at the events of this week, as we look at ideas of racism and injustice in our world today, things that hit very close to home. God, we ask right now that you would take all of these things and reassure us of your sovereignty, reassure us of your presence and your peace, despite everything that's happening around us. Our Father, we turn to you in these desperate times. We ask you for your presence. We ask you for wisdom and strength to make it through each day. And Lord, we know you are with us. We know you are here in this time where we gather to worship you. So Lord, as we do so, we pray that you are honored and that you will fill our hearts with your spirit today and always. Father, we lift up your name in music, in the study of your word, in prayer right now. And we do so knowing that you hear us. We're grateful for it. Thank you, Lord Jesus, we pray in your name. Amen. Let's begin our time together with some singing and worship through music. So good 
Romans 15, 5. May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you the spirit of unity among yourselves as you follow Christ Jesus, so that with one heart and mouth you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Oh Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made, I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed then sings my soul my savior god to thee how great thou art how great thou art then sings my soul my savior god to thee how
and 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. When peace like a river attendeth my way When sorrows like sea
Welcome back to you. My name is Pastor Scott, and I have the privilege of coming to you today around God's Word, and I want to ask his blessing on it as we dive in together. Lord Jesus, we do ask your presence right now. We ask that you would speak to us through this text. We ask that you would speak to us through these words that you spoke so long ago that still apply to our hearts even today. God, open up our hearts, open up our minds to your truth, to your voice in our lives. Be the one who speaks right now, we pray it, Lord Jesus, in your name. Amen. Well, this week here in the Twin Cities, we watched in horror and in disbelief at the events of the last few days where a young black man named George Floyd was arrested by Minneapolis police. He was accused of passing counterfeit money. And in the process of arresting this man, one of the officers kneeled down on the back of his neck for over five minutes, ignoring his cries that he couldn't breathe. Floyd eventually passed out and subsequently died as a result of this treatment. It seems to be just yet another instance of the systemic racism we see so pre prevalent in our country in so many ways. The officers involved in this were fired. And as I record this message, uh, just a couple of days after that, the FBI is getting involved and there are cries to arrest these police officers for murder, or at the very least for manslaughter. Now today, as I watch the news, the story continues to multiply. Crowds of protesters went to the police station chanting for justice. As the quotes from these stories suggest, most of what was happening in these protests was very peaceful. People were rightfully upset. They were demonstrating and protesting the injustice in the system. But then suddenly it became very non-peaceful, became very violent, in fact. In video replays, I saw rocks being thrown at police, uh, barricades being erected. I saw policemen firing back rubber bullets into the crowd, tear gas to drive the crowd away. I saw video of people spray painting graffiti on nearby stores. I saw uh, people that were looting from Target and Cub nearby. And then people started lighting these stores on fire, setting... Uh, a number of them ablaze. Some of them burned to the ground overnight. Another man was shot and killed as he attempted to break in and loot a pawn shop. We see in stories like this that pop up with disturbing regularity how violence just breeds more violence. Injustice just brings about more injustice. We see a crowd here calling for justice for the murder of George Floyd, and then this suddenly turns into theft and fire and blood as though any of these things would serve to bring justice for this man's untimely death. The world around us, our society, our culture, our entire world just doesn't know the meaning of the word peace. What we see around us are only those few minutes between those, those times where you're just waiting for the next fight to break out. In this world, we truly don't understand what peace means and what peace should be around us. In fact, in the last 3,421 years of recorded history, only 268 of those have seen no war. It's a quote from Will and Ariel Durant in their book, The Lessons of History. That's less than 8% of recorded history. The oldest corpse in the world, in fact, as you go into uh, archaeology, in anthropology, the oldest corpse in the world is named Utsi the Iceman, who is 5,300 years old. This corpse was killed because he was shot in the back with an arrow. Today, we have countless instances of violence. We look at things in the category of racism, just like with George Floyd or Amy Cooper in Central Park just a few days ago, or Ahmaud Arbery, who was killed while jogging. We've got religious persecution happening uh, fairly quietly around the world. You've got Chinese churches being destroyed. You've got Coptic Christians in Egypt. You've got Muslim countries that uh, are putting Christians to death for their beliefs. Uh, the Korean people from Myanmar, there are countless instances of this in our, in our culture, in our world. And even during our time of stay at home, uh, during this, these COVID weeks, we see statistics where domestic violence is surging because we're all stuck at home together. We don't understand what this means. We don't understand what this looks like around us. When we talk about peace, 
we truly don't have the first idea of what that means. And yet in our study of the Beatitudes, we come to this statement by Jesus who says, blessed are the peacemakers for they are the ones who shall be called sons of God. In other words, blessed are those who strive for peace in the middle of this very harsh, trouble-filled world. And I can see some people looking at this statement saying, yes, blessed are the peacemakers. And they might look at the world around us and just roll their eyes at a statement like this. They, they might look at Jesus' naivete and, and say, this isn't even possible given our culture today. We can try. It's just it's not going to do any good in the midst of this difficulty, in the midst of this mess. Peace is just a, a pipe dream. I often get the sense that uh, this beatitude in particular is one of those that we look at as, you know, just one of those things that Jesus says. A lot of those, you know, super spiritual things that sound really nice, but they just don't work out as we live our life day to day. You can't just follow everything Jesus says. That's the kind of attitude people seem to come to the beatitudes, especially this one with. But the reality is when it comes to peace, the Bible really has a lot to say. Peace in scripture is translated from the Hebrew word shalom. Said as a greeting, it's said as a blessing when friends part from each other. In many of the epistles and letters of the New Testament, almost all of them begin with the words grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Over and over again, we see in scripture this wish for peace, this blessing of peace that the Christians are giving to each other. Numbers 6, 26 is a great benediction. We say it here, here at church sometimes. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. When you go with God, you go in peace. Jesus Christ himself carries the name, the Prince of Peace. We see that in Isaiah 9, verse 6. We talk about that one, especially in the Christmas season. Even angels come and sing glory to God in the highest and on earth, what? It's peace on earth, peace to those with whom his favor rests. The beginning of Jesus's life is characterized by peace. And then one of the last things that he says to his disciples is this, peace I give to you, my peace I give you. And lest you misunderstand, he says, I don't give it to you like the world gives. My peace is not like the world's peace. When they first see him again after his resurrection, the, the first words out of Jesus' mouth are words of peace in the middle of their fear. You take all these things throughout scripture and, and so many more. You look at the vision of Isaiah as he talks about beating the swords into plowshares. You look at Jesus Christ and his ideas where he says, you know, turn the other cheek and love your enemies and do good to those who persecute you. It's not a surprise that Christianity is consistently characterized as a religion of pacifists. Uh, the understanding goes that Christians don't fight back. They aren't supposed to fight back. And, you know, to some extent that can be true, but it's not at all what peacemaking is about. Uh, that idea, I guess, falls more into the line with what we learned when we talked about meekness uh, in our study just a few weeks ago. Do you remember what we said about being meek? We referred to meekness as strength under control, a strength that would only come out when the things of God were at stake or other people were under an attack. The meek person was one who doesn't so much care for themselves as they care about what happens to people around them. Meek people are people who fight for justice. Meek people are people who stand up when the things of God are at stake. Their strength is used to fight for and defend other people. Christianity is not a pansy religion. It's not a place for wimps. But that seems to be the expectation of those outside our family who only know a few bits and pieces of what it means to be a Christian. To them, they may have heard this whole turn the other cheek thing. So it must be okay to mock and, and ridicule Christians, take advantage of them. After all, they, they're supposed to turn the other cheek, right? They're supposed to forgive the people around them. So when we talk about peace, we have to first combat this idea of what uh, culture's understanding of Christianity is. We have to understand what peace is not. Peace is not tolerance. We don't sit idly by and accept anything that comes along. We don't run away from trouble. We don't put our heads down in the sand 
and ignore things that are going on around us. This isn't the kind of peace that you get in families where you know that people are coming in on opposite sides of an issue, so you just don't talk about it. That's not the kind of peace that God is talking about here. God's peace is not about giving in to people who are set against God. It doesn't mean pretending that things aren't sometimes awful around us, that our times are not marked by difficulty and struggle. That's not what peace is at all, to ignore those things going on. Those kinds of peace aren't, aren't real peace. If you're pretending that things don't exist or you're pretending that issues aren't real issues, that's the opposite of peace, isn't it? Where you're actually walking around on eggshells, just wondering when things are going to blow up around you. Somebody once said that peace is what you get when everyone is reloading. So what are we talking about here? Well, I want to talk us through two things this morning. First, I want to talk about peace. And then I really want to dig into peacemaking because those can sometimes be very different things. So first we talk about peace. We've already glanced very briefly at a few things the Bible has to say about peace. And I want to bring some of those up once again. Number six, that that great benediction asks God to grant the people peace. This is at the end. It sums up the entire benediction. He says, show us your favor and show us your face and give us peace. It's something that we actually ask of God himself. The greeting of those letters of the New Testament, they say very much the same thing. Almost everyone, again, starting the same way. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. Just as grace can only come from God, so also peace is a gift that we can only get from God. Otherwise, you're just talking about the time between bullets. Peace, real peace, can only come from God. We looked at the Christmas story just briefly. That highlights exactly how God brings peace. Jesus Christ called that Prince of Peace. His birth led the angels to sing out peace to those on whom God's favor rests. Again, this peace can only come from God. And the last words Christ gives to his disciples again are those same words of peace, where he says, peace I give you, my peace that I give to you, I don't give as the world gives. The world's definition of peace and my definition of peace are very, very different things. They go in two very different directions. The world has its own idea. He says, my peace, the peace that I'm giving you, is something that you're going to need as you struggle with death. And even beyond that, we know that the peace of the Christian can occur even in the midst of difficult times. So where a world says peace is something that you experience when everything is comfortable around you, where everything is calm, the peace that God brings can exist not only in those kind of times, but also in the times of strife and struggle. We can experience God's peace even in the middle of a pandemic. We can experience God's peace when job loss is a reality. We can experience God's peace in the middle of an economic downturn. We can have peace even in the most difficult of times because scripture what we see as we encompass all of these together it says that peace is in the realm of god god is the one who is bringing about peace he is the one who is responsible for it so then the question is how do we balance the idea that god's god is the one that brings peace with the world that we live in this world that seems to be anything but peaceful. How do we balance those two things where God says, I am the one who brings peace into your world with a a world that doesn't seem to know peace at all. After all, we we look at Jesus's day. You know the name Pontius Pilate. He was the one responsible for putting Jesus to death on a cross. He was the Roman governor at the time. Pontius Pilate was a man known for, quote, his veniality, his violence, his thefts, his assaults, his abusive behavior, his frequent executions of untried prisoners, and his endless savage ferocity, according to the historian Philo. This is a man who stole temple funds and continued to push Jewish leaders uh, to their breaking point by bringing in pagan symbols into Jewish worship areas, uh, including the coins that everybody paid taxes with. He included pagan symbols on that uh, just to needle the Jewish leaders a little bit more. There's one story reported in Luke about how he killed some people that were coming to offer sacrifices at the temple so that their blood mixed with the blood 
of the offering, something that was just abhorrent to the Jewish people at the time. He was removed from office, finally, after killing some pilgrims, apparently just simply out of hand. And this was the world, this is one guy, this is the world that Christ was born into. He knew, he could see around him every injustice that was happening. He could see what was going on in the struggle between uh, the people of Israel and the people of Rome, the governmental and the common people, the struggles between those, the class struggles that were going on, Jews versus Gentiles. There were so many opportunities for conflict, even in Jesus' day, and it continues into our day. So given all of those examples, both in our world that you know very well and in Jesus' world, how do we say that God brings peace? We say that because there is a higher peace that God is more concerned about than a simple ceasefire. God is concerned first and foremost that people will have a relationship with him, that their relationship heart to heart is going to be restored. Peace with God is the first and most important thing. That's the kind of peace that God wants most of all. In fact, I would go so far as to say this is the whole point of the Beatitudes, to make sure that people understand what it means to have this peace with God, this relationship with God. The whole Beatitudes up until this point is, as we've said before, it's the gospel in in summary form, so that people understand what does it mean to follow God? What does it mean to be a Christian? What does it mean that we're poor in spirit and that we mourn over our sin and that God makes us meek people and merciful people and pure in heart kind of people, that we hunger after his heart and the things that he wants in our lives. These are the things that bring us into peace with God. And the goal here is to be considered children of God. As it says, we are sons and daughters of God when we are peacemakers. So the goal is to live life in the faith that God will bless us as we walk in him. That as Christians, as we have that connection with Christ, with God, our father, he is going to bring peace into our lives through him. So uh, we look through the Beatitudes, we see this, and, and the reality is when we don't have peace in our lives, we have gotten off track somewhere. We start to miss the mark. I think you could look back through your life. I I know I can do so as well, that those times where I feel most ill at ease in life, not not just the external things going on around us, but the, the, the very heart condition that we're dealing with, those are the times where I'm getting away from God that I feel so, uh, that lack of peace in my life. So being children of God, living as a member of God's family, being sons and daughters of the king, this is what is of utmost importance to us. That's what peace in God's world means. And when we are at peace with God, when we have that stable connection, when we feel his pleasure in our lives, when we feel his presence in our lives, that's why we can say we have peace even when those external circumstances seem to dictate otherwise. Even when those external circumstances are trying to blow us back and forth and knock us off our foundation, when we have peace with God, that's the moment where we are so in tune with him, so in touch with him, that it almost doesn't matter what's going on around us. Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 6, really lays this out well for us. If you want to turn there, we'll, we'll stick here for a little bit. Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 6. Paul says here, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we've also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, endurance produces character, And character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame. Because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Now there is so much here that we could spend time unpacking, but I want to just touch on it briefly here. And if you want to dig into it at home for homework, I I encourage you to do that. Uh, please feel free. But here it says, through faith, 
we have peace with God. That's the only avenue by which we can have peace with God is through faith in his son, Jesus Christ. We look at the other benefits of faith in God to, to search out what this means a little bit. What does it mean to be at peace with God? Well, it means that we stand in his grace, as it says in verse 2, which means we are forgiven in a way that we don't deserve. And then Paul goes and says something absolutely crazy. He says, we can even have peace. We even rejoice in the midst of our suffering, in the midst of the most difficult times in our life, those times where we shouldn't feel peace. That's when we can rejoice because our foundation is firm. We see that in verse three. I mean, this idea of rejoicing in suffering, this doesn't make any sense when we talk about this world that we live in, this shattered world around us, where we see things like persecution and racism and injustice and the lack of peace going on around us. But he goes on to explain, he says, you know what, your suffering, we can rejoice in it because your suffering produces endurance. Your endurance produces character and character produces hope. And it's not a wishy-washy kind of hope. It's not a pie in the sky kind of hope. This is a hope that is founded in the person of God himself. And all of this is made possible, he says, because Christ died for the ungodly. All of this connection with God himself, this foundation we have, the hope that we have, the rejoicing that we can do in suffering, it is all made possible because Jesus Christ died when we were his enemies. Christ died to make this possible for me and for you. Now hold on to that for just a second. I'm going to come right back to it. But this is what peace, in, what peace with God means. This is God's peace. It means grace. It means rejoicing and suffering. It means becoming a, a people of the cross. And it even means this certain hope beyond death that, that we have in God himself. So in light of that, if all of this is what peace is, if, if we have peace with God through faith and it leads us to hope and it leads us to endurance in suffering and it leads us to joy in the midst of difficult circumstances, then here's our second question. What does it mean to be a peacemaker? Because that's what the beatitude says here. Blessed are the peacemakers. So if this is peace, if we talk about this solid relationship with God, this connection to his heart, if this is peace, what does it mean to be a peacemaker? Well, it's an action word, isn't it? This is someone who goes out to make peace, to create peace where there is no peace. This is not passive sitting by waiting for peace to just happen to us. Author Rick Azell says, Jesus didn't say, blessed are the peace wishers or the peace hopers or the peace dreamers or the peace lovers or the peace talkers. We're not just hoping for peace. We're not wishing that peace is going to happen around us. We are to make peace. So if we start from this definition where peace is being right with God, if peace is that connection that we have to his heart, joining us together in right relationship again, then what is peacemaking except the active reconciliation of God and his people? It is going out and, and building those relationships between God and his people. It is the restoration of that relationship between the two. And then also God's people to each other. That is also part of the peace of God that exists in our hearts and our lives. So here's the great paradox of this idea of peace. If, if we think of peace as a calm feeling or a safe feeling or a place where we're cozy and we're at rest, peacemaking, almost by definition, I would say, is the opposite of that. Because you don't step into a situation as a peacemaker when peace is already there, where you feel safe, where you feel comfortable, where you feel like things are going well. That's not peacemaking. That's peace enjoying, I think. Peacemaking is when you step in between two antagonistic parties that are firing at each other, sometimes literally, and you bring it to a point where the, the antagonism and the fighting has calmed down and you can have peace. Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin once said, peace is not made with friends. Peace is made with enemies. And dealing with enemies can sometimes be very, very messy. But the reality is Christ himself is our model here. If we look at Colossians chapter 1, verses 19 to 22, 
it talks about how Jesus Christ made peace. Let's read that together. Colossians 1, 19 to 22. For in him, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. This is Jesus Christ we're talking about. And through him then, to reconcile to himself all things, whether on heaven, excuse me, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. You who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he is now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. Now we look at those words. We, they come from the Apostle Paul talking about Jesus Christ. These are harsh words. It talks about the blood of the cross. It talks about Jesus' sacrificial death. But that's how Jesus Christ made peace. He made peace, peace by the blood of his cross. And we who were enemies of his, and that's in, that includes all of us, those of us who are enemies of Jesus Christ, we are described with words like alienated and hostile and evil. And now he says we are made holy and blameless because Jesus Christ went out and made peace. By his sacrificial death on the cross, Jesus Christ went and made peace. He bridged the gap between two antagonistic parties. God's wrath was rightly going to be poured out on us because we were enemies of his, doing our own thing, spitting in God's face, shaking our fists at him. Jesus Christ steps into the middle and through his bloody death on the cross, he makes peace. Making peace means sacrifice. Making peace means sometimes we're getting a little bit uncomfortable Making peace means we are stepping away from those words that bring comfort and platitudes. It gets us into the uncomfortable place of speaking truth in places where it's unpopular. Making peace means that we're not backing down if God's truth is at stake or if God's people are oppressed. That's when we step in to make peace between God and people, between people, people and and other people. We looked last week at the words of Christ to the Pharisees where he said, woe to you scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which outwardly appear beautiful, but within are full of dead people's bones and all uncleanness. So you also outwardly appear righteous to others, but within you're full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. These do not sound like words that are peaceable, But these are exactly the words necessary to make peace. To bring this group of people that is so antagonistic to God and to his love and to his reality in our lives. And this this group of Pharisees that just is going the opposite direction. Making peace with God can sometimes mean confronting hypocrisy. Making peace can sometimes mean going out and clearing the temple of the money changers. Making peace means sometimes striving to reconcile people to the living God through, again, the blood of Jesus Christ. Sometimes this means shaking the foundations because people think they're at peace with God sometimes just because things are going well in their lives when in reality they are so far from him. In reality, they are so self-reliant They don't have peace with God. It's an illusion that they've created for themselves. Romans 12, 18 gives us our marching orders when it comes to peace. It says, if possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Let me say a couple of things on this verse here. These two words at the beginning, if possible. These suggest that it's not always going to be possible. They're going to be those who live their whole life with their fist raised to heaven, saying, forget you, God. I I don't want you. I don't need you. It's nothing to me. Their salvation, Paul says here, is not your responsibility. God is the one who saves. Our job is to attempt to make peace, to bring peace, to reconcile the two parties together. And that means shaking some of these people's foundations. 
but sometimes it's just not going to be possible. And all this leans right on the next phrase where Paul says, as far as it depends on you. But what else does Jesus Christ say? He says things like pray for your enemies. He says things like do good to those who persecute you. He says things like model peace, live out the gospel in your lives. This is what our call is. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. And when we are living at peace, that means we are bringing the truth of God into sometimes very difficult situations. Sometimes this looks like making friends with somebody in the middle of tough times. Sometimes this means shaking your friends from a very comfortable, safe place that they seem to be residing in. Sometimes it's living out the love of God for somebody that desperately needs it. Sometimes it's speaking an uncomfortable truth into somebody's life who desperately needs to hear it. And I can hear some of you saying, Scott, those are very, very different things. How do, we, how do we do those things? How do we make peace in these kind of situations? How do we even know how to make peace? Well, here's my advice to all of us, myself included. The first and foremost is to pray. Got to start there. We are acting as reconcilers. We are, we are bringing the living God into reality, helping people to know him better, sometimes simply by living a very different life than the, the lives they would see around them. Sometimes very clearly speaking truth into places that it hasn't been spoken before, but we need to pray. Because only through prayer are we going to understand, are we going to hear from God what this person needs. And as we get to know God better, then we know how to share him better. And God is going to direct us in the words that we have to speak to people. God is going to help us know what to say. We just got to stay connected to him. So first we pray as we make peace, as we bring peace into difficult situations. We pray. Second, someone once gave me this job description for a pastor. The pastor's job is to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. And it seems to me that this is the job of the peacemaker as well. There are going to be people out there who need their foundations shaken a little bit. They're too comfortable and they need to be afflicted just a little bit. On the other side of that coin, there are many people out there who need to be comforted in their affliction with the love of God. So here's the primary question and here's part number two. First, we pray. Second, we ask this question, what is going to bring somebody closer to God? Does this person need to be comforted? Does this person need to be shaken up just a little bit in their comfortable life? What is going to bring somebody closer to God? And then that's what we do. So we pray, we ask, what is going to bring somebody closer to God? And third, we be at peace with God ourselves. Got to start there. Got to make that part of this entire program. When you are at peace with God, you are going to be able to speak out of that peace into somebody's life. If you're not at peace with God, then you're not going to be able to do that. Ephesians 6 talks about the armor of God, and it says, Stand, therefore, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace as shoes for your feet. So the Beatitudes gives us the gospel of peace, this idea that we are children of God, that we are at peace with the king of the universe. And now we put that on our feet. We follow the path. We walk it out. We exercise it day by day. And that leads us again to be children of God, to be sons and daughters of the king. And so as children of God, standing in the peace of God, we get to stand firm. Those words of Ephesians 6, to stand therefore, being ready. Stand therefore in endurance. Stand even in the midst of suffering. You stand because you have the peace of God living inside you. And this is how we live out the task of the peacemaker. We start by being connected to God himself. Now, there are some of you listening to me today, you may not be at peace with God. You may be listening to me saying, I, I don't have that. I don't, I don't have that sense of connection with him. And once again, I would say to you, that's where we need to start. You need that peace in and of yourself to be connected with our king before you can go out and share his love with other people. So don't let today slip by. 
If that's you today, if you're not feeling that peace with God, I invite you, even before I'm done, that's the beauty of the internet right now, is you can pause this message, you can fall down on your knees and pray, God, I need you, I need your peace, I need that reconciliation between me and you. And then unpause, I'll be, I'll be here when you come back, that's just fine. At the end of the day, peacemaking isn't easy. Peacemaking is not a, a walk in the park, and today's peaceless world makes that job even tougher. But this is our job as Christians, isn't it? We look at the, the Great Commission, and it basically says this, to go out and be peacemakers. Those aren't exactly the words it uses, but the Great Commission tells us to go and make disciples. In other words, go and help people to be reconciled with God. With slightly different words, the Great Commission could say, go, be peacemakers in God's name. Be reconcilers. Go and bring people back to God. And in this way, says Jesus, in this way, those of you who go out as makers of peace, as people who bring God's name into places where it hasn't been heard before, where where you help bring the truth of God's word into people's lives, in this way, we're going to be called sons and daughters of God. Now, I have uh, a number of people that say my kids look very much like me. Uh, Sometimes I see it, sometimes I don't as much, but uh, it's not just looks. And this is the the much more obvious piece. There's a lot of words my kids use that are words that I use. There's a lot of mannerisms and things my kids do that I see, oh yeah, that's something that I do as well. There are a lot of things they enjoy that I have enjoyed with them. This is how we are to be considered sons and daughters of God, where we are modeling God's character qualities. And if God is a God of peace, if God is a God who is reconciling people to himself by the power of the cross, then we're going to be the same. We have to be the same as God's sons and as God's daughters. We model what we see our Father in heaven doing. So we are here to reconcile people to God as best we can. At the end of the day, it is, it is God's job to stir a heart. But what we can do is make it possible. What we can do is bring it about that they can come and see Jesus in a new way. We're here to model him as best we can in the world. And when people look at us and, and see how strange we are because we're trying to model Jesus Christ, where they lift their eyebrows and cock their heads and say, what's going on here? We point to Jesus. We point to God. We point to the peace that they can have with him. This is why peacemaking comes here, I believe, toward the end of the Beatitudes. Because unless we've come to Christ, unless we've gone through the steps of being poor in spirit and mourning over our past life, this task of making peace, this is beyond us. We're not going to have peace in ourselves yet, so we cannot make peace out in the world. We need to be meek people. We need to hunger after God's righteousness. We need to not be hungering after those things that we can gain for ourselves. If we're going to be making peace, we cannot be seen as people that have a stake in this issue, that we're going to get something out of it. We need to come with mercy for the hurting. We need to come with a model of purity in our own lives because when we get to live like Jesus, when he has recreated us enough that we start to look odd to the world around us, that's when we can be peacemakers. And that is our mission at the end of the day, to be small models of God himself, to reconcile people to him. That's our mission, and it is a worthy one, to call a wounded world into God's peace through Jesus Christ. So Lord Jesus, we come to you at the end of this sermon time, and I want to ask Lord Christ, that you would make us sons and daughters of yours. Lord Jesus, would you give us the strength and the wisdom we need to be peacemakers in the world? We thank you in advance for calling us and for sending us out in your power, in your grace. Open those doors, Lord, that we can make peace in your name that we can introduce new people to you that don't have the faintest idea of what real peace can be in our lives. We thank you, Lord Jesus, and we pray it in your name. 
And now in the benediction, may the Lord bless you and may he keep you. May he lift up his face and shine it upon you and be gracious to you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen. Thank you for joining us today. Go in peace.